Yeah. Ready, ready to go? Let's go. So I'm a government contractor by day, and I just ah, do this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. All right. Okay. You ready? Yes. This room is very green. <laughs> Dr. Mary Neal Featon, a Naval commander, has created a program called the Warfighter Advance, Advance Seven Day for Post Deployment Warfighters, Past and Present. This seven day program provides the tools for a life characterized by pride, productivity, and service for warfighters in post deployment. All right, well, welcome. Thank so, you. can you please tell us a little bit about your background in military service? Sure. Um, I was 10 years on active duty, and uh, then in 2008 I transferred to the reserves. And since I've uh, been in the reserves, I probably should have read the fine print a little more carefully because I've spent two more years on active duty. Uh, one year was my second deployment, and uh, one year I uh, was at the Pentagon. Uh, and that, uh, during that time at the Pentagon, I worked on the Navy Chief of Chaplain staff. All right. So can you tell us a little bit about how PTSD affects veterans on their return to civilian lives? Sure. Um, the first thing I would say about that is that uh, in our program we would never use the term PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, and we don't even use the term post-traumatic stress. Um, and the reason is that we have uh, intentionally distanced ourselves from the medical model and from the, all of the labels that go along with it. And what that does is it, it helps our warfighters to um, talk about their trauma it, without using medical terms or hiding behind medical terms. So, um, but the, the, what we use the term reintegration and the process of reintegration is, um, can be very, very difficult because when you come back traumatized um, and you bring back the, um, the traumas that go along with war, there's a lot of uh, suffering and emotional um, implications for that. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about this program and how this helps veterans who are reintegrating back from deployments. So what we do basically, um, is set up a, a smorgasbord of um, uh, opportunities to smooth that reintegration process. And um, we, we ask the warfighters to use some of their military skills in going through the possible things that they could do to reintegrate more easily. Um, things like, like um, assessing a risk-benefit ratio, for example. And so um, if somebody hands, offers you a medication and one of the potential side effects is death, um, and you know, you uh, look at you know, what is the implications of, for example, keeping your symptom, um, then sometimes you, know, you, you get them to realize that, wow, maybe this medication thing isn't such a good idea. But there are other things you can try, like exercise and um, some uh, things that have been proven, like yoga, or there's uh, products called, called the Alpha Stim. Um, I'm trying to think neurofeedback. There's just so many other things where that risk-benefit ratio is um, is not as dramatic, and you know we get ask them to really work hard on um, assessing things and uh, deciding what to what to, what to implement. Mm -hmm. I mean that sounds like a really great model, and definitely taking a more holistic view of um, the the approach for wellness. Mm -hmm. So, who may participate in this Warfighter Advanced Seven Day Program? So we have participants who are active duty, uh, reservists, and also um, veterans. Uh, we don't put dates on the service. Some programs say you know only OIF, OEF. So we have Vietnam veterans, um, it, you know, uh, Gulf War veterans, and also the people from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so we we don't put uh, time parameters, but we also don't um, restrict it to combat veterans per se because a lot of what military members do is very high op tempo, and um, and tr you know trauma doesn't necessarily only occur to people who are putting bullets down range. Um, sometimes it can be on the deck plate of a ship or in a training accident. Lots of things happen to us in in our work that um, you know we can uh, you know that can make it very difficult for us when we try to reintegrate into the civilian world. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So. And who can participate as far as location? Are they limited to the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area, or is it nationwide? So um, we take participants from any state or territory, and um, we take responsibility for that transportation door to door. So um, if people uh, want to come to the program and they're in California, um, we buy them a plane ticket and, and bring them out. We've had uh, three Marines come from as far as Hawaii, and so we're. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we're, we're committed to uh, anybody who wants to get off of this medical merry-go-round and um, reintegrate fully into uh, the civilian world. You know, we're committed to uh, bringing them in. Okay, so a nationwide program, and then where is it held? So it's held in Charles County, which is um, south of here. It's about, we're about 60 miles south of Washington, D.C., on the Potomac River. It's very beautiful. Um, the actual area is called Nanjamoy, and uh, it's uh, directly across the uh, Potomac River from Quantico. Okay, all right. So tell us about this um, Camp Merrick, it's called, and uh, what, what it brings to your program. So Lions Camp Merrick, it's uh, owned by the Lions Club, is our, they host us and um, we uh, rent the property for, from them. Um, and they're an absolutely wonderful partner in um, the, the work that we do. So they provide the room and board and um, uh, the, uh, the outdoor and experiential learning activities. They provide our, our sort of our safety staff and that kind of thing for the, the different things that we do on the campus. Oh, that sounds like a great partnership. It is. <laughs> um, so are the participating veterans required to pay for their services that they receive during that seven days? Not at all. Um, we fundraise um, and to make sure that um, one of the biggest barriers to uh, care a lot of times or to reintegrating is that people just don't have the funds to, to do something that's not directly offered by the VA. And so in order to remove that barrier, we fundraise whenever we're not actually running a program uh, so that we can keep this uh, free door to door. So the travel, room, board, tuition, materials, everything is at no cost to the veteran. Wow, what a great benefit. Yeah. Um, so what are the aims of your program to assist veterans? So the, the major aim, it's a couple of things, but the, one of the biggest aims is to um, help the veteran or the service member to break away from this patient identity, the, the idea that they're somehow a a patient and they've got to um, uh, wear this label of mental illness um, for the rest of their lives. So we help them to um, break out of that mold, um, again, begin to use the skills of a, of a warfighter to assess the risks and benefits of the different things that are offered to them. Um, we also uh, spend a great deal of time remediating what's called fully informed consent. Um, and what that means is that the things that are offered to them we break it down so that they understand the risks and the benefits. And so um, when they leave our program, they understand right down to the molecular level why um, the psychopharmacology is never going to help. It can't help it scientifically. It's impossible for it to help. And they actually understand that. And um, it's very empowering then, um, you know, when they go back home and people are saying, hey, you really should take this pill or that pill or try this thing. Um, and they, they're able to articulate why that's not a really good idea, but there are other things that can help them. So basically you're setting them up for future success and wellness without, you know, the the label or mm -hmm. pharmacology, you know, as an absolute. Right. Uh, yes. And, and, and again, information is always power. And part of um, the idea behind fully informed consent is that you have the power to make uh, an informed decision. Um, when people come through our program, one of the things they find is that they've been making, um, accepting the, the recommendations of providers or a lot other people without knowing what the implications of that were. Um, and so, and once they have that uh, full gamut of information, they're very unlikely to consent to you know some of the really dangerous things that are offered to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, oh, that's very important. Um, so what are the, sorry, um, can you advance the teleprompter, please? Take a quick break right here. Do you want a sip of water real quick? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, so how does the program approach these needs of the veterans? These needs. Is there any clarification on what this is asking? Because I think you may have just answered it mm. with the previous question from what I am understanding. It says, what are the aims, and then how does it address them? But I think you really answered that. Oh, I guess I could, I could say something to that. Um, so the, the way we address it is um, through uh, 96 hours of programming all crammed into one week. 
Um, there's a great deal of education, as I mentioned, um, experts coming in and talking about the various um, things that they really need to know about. So uh, experts on things like informed consent um, and um, experts on the different tools that we believe meet this risk-benefit ratio. Um, they get, uh, for example, an hour and a half lecture on um, nutrition and how nutrition and what you eat can affect your mood. Um, and how, what changes they can make to their diet. That's just one example. Um, a lot of the things that we um, are suggesting to them meet that risk-benefit ratio, they, we allow them to try during the week. So we set up opportunities for them so that when they go out into the community, for example, um, and they're looking to try neurofeedback, it's not scary because they've already seen the equipment and they know what it, what it does and that it doesn't hurt and you know that kind of thing. So even though we don't offer any type of treatment, we do offer um, some information and the ability to try some different things so that they can decide if they like them or if they're valuable to them. Yeah, that's really important because then it makes it seem not so scary or not so intimidating. Right. And maybe opens up other avenues that they may not have considered sure, previously. Sure, sure. And then we do it in, in a much lighter environment because mm -hmm. instead of them being isolated in a doctor's office, you know, they're trying it in front of 20 people that they're actually really good friends with and they're laughing and you know, and it just brings down that intimidation factor a lot. Um, we also do a lot of uh, outdoor activities and do things where we build uh, rapport as a group so that um, when one of the things about the medical model is that it is so isolating. You know, you, you go into a doctor's office and you sit there with a person who's telling you that you're mentally ill and you have no one to ask, you know, what do you think about this? Um, or, you know, doesn't seem right, but you know, I have to accept it because here we are. Um, so we do a lot with, um, you know, backing out of that isolation model and, and building camaraderie and suggesting that when they have problems, they should go to the entire group, um, like you would in the military, mm -hmm. and ask, ask the group to support you in your hour of need. It works very, very well after they leave the program. Sure, absolutely. And how many people are typically go through the program at one time? So how big is the group that they're bonding mm -hmm. with? So of 20 new people is the average, so, you know, 17 to 23. And then we usually, for every four people that go through, we have someone who's a, a mentor that, who's been through the program before. You know, again, it's, it's kind of a, a warfighter model that you have uh, people who are younger and newer and mm -hmm. not as far down their journey and then you have people that are farther down that journey leading the way. Um, and so uh, we, we bring in that ment mentor uh, component um, and you know no, everybody who uh, is in that role is someone who's uh, been through the same things. They're just farther down the road. Sure. So it really brings back a model of familiarity that they mm -hmm. were used to in the military as well. Right. Yes. And there's n at no point um, do we bring in a mental health professional and say, you know, this person's in charge. They've got the final say. That does not happen. Okay. So you would say that these approaches are distinct from any other approach that, you know, are typical or a standard approach that you may have seen. So there are models out there that are similar that, you know, use what they would say alternative therapies. Mm -hmm. But again, that word therapy suggests that something is being treated. And at the end of the day, they're still nodding at the idea that this is a psychiatric problem. And we reject that entirely. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. So you mentioned that people who come in and are there for every four people who have been through the program before. So these are other veterans who have been through the program before. So. What other roles do they play besides a mentor? Is, are they, do they follow as the people finish the program? Do they stay in touch with them, or how does that work? So we have, an, what we do is because we're a, a training program, um, we sort of follow the model of we graduate people at the end of the week, and then they join our alumni association. And so um, everyone's sort of dumped into this alumni association. Um, and then we have lots of ways that that uh, alumni association is um, very, very active going forward in supporting. So instead of having follow-on treatment or follow-on care, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, the alumni association is responsible for that. We do have a, an alumni director who's also a, a veteran, a post-deployment veteran. Um, and we have a Facebook page, a private Facebook page that only alumni of the program can access. And so they can... Um, uh, go in there and, and uh, talk to each other via Facebook or messaging um, if they have problems or if they have questions or has anybody tried this? What do you think about that? 
um, talking about their successes. So, for example, this week we had a young man who graduated in um, early October who has uh, managed to, under medical supervision, taper off of almost all his medicine. He's on his way to zero. Um, but he, when, um, when I met him, um, couldn't think his own thoughts to the end. And he just got a job as an engineer. So he's wow. back in his original career. He thought he'd never work there again. Um, he's a, about to become a father for the first time. And so he's very, very excited that he's going to be able to actually support his family, mm -hmm. but not with disability money, right. with, with an income. And he's, um, he's proud to be paying taxes again. So That's great. So super exciting. But, you know, those kind of uh, uh, successes are also celebrated on our private page and sometimes on our, our public page if the, um, if the warfighter wants us to do that. I think ongoing communities of support are so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and a lot of programs have a, um, a limited, you know, they say, well, we follow them for 18 months or we follow them for six months. And, and as an alumni association sort of implies, it's a forever thing. As right. long as you want to participate, um, the alumni association is there for you. That's great. Yeah. How, how many years have you been doing this program? So um, this, in, in its exact form, uh, We've been doing it since the fall of uh, 2014, I want to say. Um, the, the, the prototype was done um, in 2004 in uh, Puerto Rico, and it was done while I was still on active duty. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it's, it's a model, you know, again, because it's, um, it really takes on that medical component pretty directly, so it's kind of hard to do in that environment. Mm -hmm. And that went uh, largely into the reason that I got out of the military was to be able to um, to be, be able to put this model forward and, and run this program um, outside of the constraints of the, the government. Okay. Um, and speaking of the government, is your program associated with the Department of Veterans Affairs? Not at all. Um, and one of the things, we don't um, have a you know, position one way or the other on what the Department of Veterans Affairs is doing other than that we don't um, use a medical model as they, um, they do. But um, we, we really feel like there needs to be a conversation about um, uh, diagnosing, labeling, and drugging our veterans. Um, and so we feel like by staying out of that, um, you know, staying outside of that uh, organization altogether, we're able to kind of hold up a mirror to that and, and be a different voice um, so that the, the conversation gets had. I think if everything gets subsumed under the same umbrella, um, then voices get quieted that really um, probably should be part of the conversation. Mm, absolutely. So then how does your program sustain itself? So as I alluded to before, fundraising, fundraising, <laughs> fundraising. Um, so whenever we are not um, directly running a program, almost everybody that's involved, and also a lot of people who um, are not necessarily involved during the, the week, um, we're out fundraising. So we have a board of directors that does a lot of fundraising, and we have... Um, a lot of sort of friends of Warfighter Advance that do um, uh, fundraising for us. And um, so we just spend a lot of time uh, looking for um, groups to, that are willing to support us. So um, for example, we have um, a number of defense contractors that um, support us. We recently got a very large grant from Boeing. Oh, wow. um, we have uh, down in Southern Maryland, uh, outside of Pax River, there's a lot of uh, defense contractors that um, support us, which and they're very, very generous with their support. Um, we have uh, three motorcycle clubs that support us, and so they do rides for us, scavenger hunts, different events, That's great. Um, and uh, they actually they raise a lot of money, and it's um, it's just really uh, fun to have them come. They also um, the the representatives of these different organizations usually come to the the opening of each of our events and, and welcome the new participants in. So we usually have motorcycle people there in their colors and defense contractors in their ties and politicians in their, you know, usual stuff. So mm -hmm. it's kind of fun. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, so if people want to get involved and they're not veterans, are there opportunities for volunteering or for helping out? There's always opportunities in the fundraising side and, and spreading the word, that's for sure. Um, during the actual retreat week, um, you know, we're kind of quiet into ourselves, um, so there's not a, a, a whole bunch of opportunities. But we do have, um, for example, the, uh, 
American Legion in La Plata. They've been very, very helpful coming out and doing laundry during the week so that we can, you know, we don't, our participants are not having to do their own laundry. Um, and they, uh, during our opening dinner, serve tables and um, they help us break down the camp at the end and uh, do uh, the, wash the bedding and that kind of thing that really just needs to be done. So um, most of the, um, the volunteering that's directly related to the week is kind of menial labor. But um, we have awesome people that come out and help us with it. And, and that way the, the, the warfighters can concentrate on the reason that they're, they're there and not worry about things like, you know, where are my clean socks, you know. Right, right. So. Okay, and if veterans want to get involved, is there a different process for them? So mm -hmm. what we ask people to do if, if they're interested in getting involved is to come through the program. So, and once a person's been through the program, if they can sort of push the I believe button and say this is the right thing, to do, then um, you know we're we're glad to bring them back as mentors and um, allow them to participate as as much as they want to in the alumni association fundraising, um, that you know that that sort of thing. So the the motorcycle clubs that um, support us are what we call one percenter motorcycle clubs. Mm -hmm. So they're all uh, veterans, combat veterans themselves, um, and so um, some of them participate in the program, but but mostly they are just uh, fundraising because they know the importance of what we're doing. Sure. And then how many times a year do you do you have the retreat? So we basically have it as many times as we can possibly fund it. So um, in 2019 we have uh, six uh, events scheduled. Uh, we'd like to bring that up to as many as ten. Um, it's you know within the next year or two. Uh, so it just again it's always a matter of the the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And um, you know we we never have trouble getting the participants. In fact, we do not, this is kind of an interesting fun fact, I guess, that we do not um, fundraise, or, or we don't recruit for the actual participation in any way. Um, everybody who comes, it tends to be word of mouth um, from people who've graduated and they go home and talk to their friends on Facebook or the people that they went to war with and say, hey, you know, you really need to go to this program. Um, and then um, for, for us, we feel like that's the, the greatest compliment there is, that somebody Absolutely. who graduated is out there say, saying, hey, you know, you need to do this. Um, so, but that's, you know, by the time the, the next one comes, it's always full, just based on word of mouth. So mm -hmm. we always have a waiting list. Wow. Well, that's yeah. a great compliment, that it's all word of mouth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Um, so we'll return to this discussion after a message about service. They're going to cut away on that. One moment. Okay. And we return with our guest, Dr. Mary Neal Featon. Okay, they may have a few questions. Those were all I had in the time. Okay. Center. Okay. Are you hearing voices? Well, are we supposed to do well, a consistency thing? I was wondering about that. All right. And then it'll look like you're crossing it. I know, <laughs> which I might be doing. So that's why I was hoping to kind of slide that in. Okay, we'll sit like this. Okay, we're we ready. Do a, uh, consistency. Sounds good. Okay. That's funny. Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. So, how does PTSD affect veterans on their return to civilian lives? So when um, warfighters come back from deployments, operational deployments, high op tempo deployments, we call them, where um, events have happened that traumatize them, um, they, they frequently have a, just a really hard time fitting in. It's kind of like their, their fight or flight response is stuck in the on position. And um, they come back, and it, this is something that they can't just turn off at will. And so um, it's very difficult for them to uh, exist in a world that is um, not very high op tempo. And one of the things we, we talk very often about at, at the advanced seven day is that um, when your fight or flight response is stuck in the on position and you're in a deployment setting, you feel very normal. But when it's stuck in the on position and you walk into Walmart, you just feel very, very crazy because think you, you have so much... Um, awareness and so much uh, adrenaline and, and you don't need it there and it just feels you feel a little bit crazy so um, 
so this can be problematic for the, the warfighter because they're, um, they're in that fight or flight mode all the time. And so what civilians will see is things like road rage or um, this inability to control their temper or always being um, kind of on edge or very vigilant. Um, and these are the things that um, frequently get called the psychiatric symptoms. They're the things that get labeled as, um, you know, you have post-traumatic stress or you have an anxiety problem. Um, when actually there are, are operational conditioning um, just in a, in a place where we don't need that operational conditioning. And it feels very strange to us as well. No one told us that when we got back, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to turn it off. Um, but when you understand that, um, it, it gives you a control that you wouldn't have otherwise because um, you, when you understand what it legitimately is, um, then you can begin the process of uh, slowing yourself down and um, uh, you know, reintegrating um, in, a, in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. So how are the approaches for your program distinct from other major programs? So probably the biggest distinction is that it is a training program. So we're not, we don't label people, um, and we, um, in, in fact, we don't even look at paperwork when someone comes in. So no one has to prove they have a certain disorder or a certain problem. Um, we just take their word for it that they're having, you know, struggling um, or suffering, one of those two things. And, um, but we um, bring them in and educate them and um, give them the tools they need and the abilities to um, practice those things, try things, um, and do that in an environment that is non-medical and non-threatening and non-isolating, um, and um, basically empower them uh, to uh, choose among the things. Not everyone's going to like everything we have to offer. Um, I think another huge distinctive is that everything we do is done with complete dignity. So. Um, for example, we have people that call us up and say, hey, when we get there, are you going to take our belt and our shoelaces? And, you know, and, and because they've been on an inpatient program or they've been um, in an environment where that occurred, and you, I'll say to them, do you need me to take your shoelaces? And they, well, no, you know, they're kind of indignant. And I say, well, I don't think I need to take them either. You know, we trusted you in uh, Afghanistan with a machine gun. I think we can trust you, you know, at Camp Merrick with your shoelaces. And so, you know, that's something that we're, we're very, very careful about is that from the moment they hit the deck, as the Navy would say, that they, um, they realize they're not in a treatment program and their dignity is going to be preserved at, at all times. That's really important. Um, so if someone wanted to apply for the program, what are the steps that they need to do to get information or to contact you? Or um, is there an application or do they place a phone call? Sure. Um, we have a website, warfighteradvance.org, and um, on the website, super easy, you know, we're always about breaking down barriers. Um, there's a, a thing right on the front homepage that says attend, and you click on that thing, and the uh, application comes up. It takes about five minutes to fill it out, um, and we just get a little bit of information about you, and then, um, then within a, a little a couple of hours, you know, usually someone from the program will call the person who applied, and just make sure it's a good fit, and a um, that they really know what they're getting into <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, want what we have to offer. Um, and then after that, you know, we just keep in touch with them and um, until they, uh, ha you know, have a chance to arrive at our program. But, you know, somebody will contact them and arrange for their um, travel, those kinds of things. So um, we, um, if they, they're bringing a service dog, there's a place to... Um, you know, make sure that they let us know something about their service dog and, um, you know, we'll fly the dog out as well. Um, so, but I think, I think that answers your question, right? About, yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. So how does your program sustain itself? So we, we um, have a lot of uh, friends who uh, donate and uh, generously support us mostly uh, defense contractors, individual donors, um, and then we have certain groups that really support us like uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, one percenter motorcycle clubs that support us, um, do rides and different types of events. Um, sometimes uh, some of the local companies that are in Southern Maryland, you know, get together and do um, different types of uh, e events to help uh, 
raise the money that we need to um, make sure that the program uh, remains free for the warfighter and um, that they don't have to uh, worry about how they're going to um, pay for the event. Mm -hmm. And then how many events a year do you typically put on? Um, we, it, we're increasing. Um, we hope to eventually get to a level where we're putting on at least 10 a year. At this point, we're doing six. Um, and as, as we fundraise and as the um, funding becomes available, um, it's very easy for us to um, uh, add uh, programs because uh, we're using Lions Camp Merrick and um, they have a robust summer program and we use them in the off season. Um, and that's, so it's good for them and good for us so their uh, facility doesn't lay empty during the winter months. Sure. All right, well thank you very much. I know. <laughs> I think we hit all their questions though. Okay. That last one was